Wonderful. And it looks like we're live. So hi, everyone at home. Uh, welcome back to another Wednesday evening talk coming to you from Cambridge University Astronomy. Um, it's pretty wet and windy all over the UK right now. So we're not going to have any stargazing afterwards. Um, seems to be a bit of a theme that's happening this year. But as always, we're going to make up for it with a very fantastic talk from our headline speaker. Um, I'm here with Ingerin Thavanesan, who is a PhD student uh, working with Will Handley here at uh, the Kavli Institute for Cosmology. And he's going to be telling us all about the topsy-turvy quantum world. Uh, so over to you, Ingerin. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Yeah. Hi, guys. So, yeah, as Matt said, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about the quantum world. So, um, yeah, let's uh, get started, I guess. So, um, I'm going to, like, give you a quick little, like, brief overview of who I am. So, you, you got some sort of connection to who's giving this weird talk to you. Um, so, yeah, if you uh, want to uh, know more about me, um, uh, First thing you'd like to, probably would like to know is that um, I'm from a Sri Lankan Tamil background. Um, uh, my parents were uh, born and raised in Sri Lanka, and they came over as uh, refugees. And I was born in Britain a few years afterwards. And uh, today is actually my dad's birthday, so I'd like to dedicate this talk to him. Uh, so happy birthday, dad! And um, I, after coming. Being born I studied at school as most of you are probably doing and uh, was uh, became an undergrad student where I was supervised for my third year by Professor Kathy Clark who really inspired my um, interest in cosmology and astrophysics as a whole and then I went on to do a master's um, under my master's thesis supervisor Dr Timothy Clifton um, yeah so uh, he's a um, expert in things like modified gravity and generally gravitational physics and cosmology. Um, and then after that, I then um, became a student, uh, as Matt said, of Will Handley's. And yeah, I'm now pursuing a PhD in theoretical cosmology. Um, so what does that mean? So um, cosmology is basically looking at the universe as a whole um, and trying to understand how it came to be and how it evolves. And what I specifically focus on, if you're interested, is the early universe and trying to kind of understand how the early universe came to be and what kind of weird and wacky stuff goes on there. Um, and yeah, if you want to contact me or get to know more about me, I have a Twitter page and uh, you, my email address is also there. And I will have a website up and running soon, which will have all the links to all the different wacky things that I'm doing. And, uh, you can find out more there. So cool, let's start talking about quantum physics. So for this talk, I'm going to try and uh, convince you that not only is like, quantum physics appropriate for the small things, as you've probably been told, but it's actually appropriate for everything that goes on in the universe. And um, I am going to try and motivate that for you in this talk. But um, to do that, I'm going to kind of start with the history of what kind of gave us our understanding of quantum physics. And to do that, we actually do need to start with very small. So the very, like one of the very smallest things that we know and have come to understand uh, as a human race is the, the atom. And uh, this is a picture of a fairly like comprehensive picture of what we know about the atom, which is that it's made up of this thing called a nucleus at the center and that, that is then made up of protons and neutrons and those in turn are actually made up of these things called quarks and around this nucleus you have the electron and the person who actually discovered this structure of the atom more specifically the the fact that there's like this electronic nucleus uh, at the toy model is Ernest Rutherford uh, here at Cambridge and um, well uh, a very long time ago but yeah um what what that actually led to was kind of an investigation into how the atom works. So um, we, we found that if you do this standard sort of like planetary um, understanding of the atom, uh, where you have an electron orbiting this nucleus, you can't actually really um, have the consistent model with physics because technically speaking, the electron should actually inspiral inwards into the atom eventually because it will 
when it's orbiting around the the nucleus, it will just uh, radiate energy and then eventually fall inwards. So we had to come up with a resolution to this. And this is where the likes of Niels Bohr and Rutherford himself uh, resolved this issue by this sort of approximate quantum model um, where they said that you don't have these, uh, you don't have um, uh, a continuum of uh, uh, energy levels. So you, you, can, you only have specific energy levels that the electron can take. So the way to think about that in, when you think about planets uh, that, that are orbiting the sun, you can only have them being at specific distances around the sun. So they can't just be like any particular distance that you like, which is a bit weird if you think about it, because you think, why can't I just place my electron here or there? Um, and this is where the weird world of quantum physics comes, from, comes in. And so what do we mean by quantum? So uh, as I said, like, the, the actual meaning of the word quantum is uh, discreteness, like not a continuous flow or something. It's a, you've got like a specific integer discrete packets of things. And um, uh, the, the way we kind of uh, justify this is through this experiment known as the photoelectric effect. So like uh, this, this experiment showed us that, um, the, that when we have, uh, um, light shining on uh, some sort of metal such as zinc, um, we we would classically expect that the light would energize the electrons in this zinc to eventually be emitted outwards. And this isn't what we actually find for all wavelengths. We only find this for specific wavelengths. And this kind of like completely challenged our understanding of classical physics. And um, we needed to come up with a better theory uh, for, to explain this. Um, one that explained why if you have photons with uh, a large enough energy, they would, so like light waves with large enough energy, they would um, be able to energize the electrons and have them emitted. And uh, this is where the likes of Einstein and Millikan came in who uh, came up with the law of the photoelectric effect and verified experimentally. And this, this idea of having uh, uh, photons, uh, no, not just uh, waves, uh, light acting as waves, but as these wave packets called photons, um, uh, gave us uh, uh, an initial step into our understanding of this thing called wave particle duality. And um, then uh, another uh, another physicist who came in and extended this idea beyond just electrons and photons was de Broglie. He took this idea to the extreme and thought that you could apply this to any particles that we know in the world. And he came up with this formula known as the de Broglie wavelength. And um, the, the de Broglie wavelength, um, oh, sorry, the, the de Broglie wavelength uh, basically shows you that um, re regardless of what, whatever kind of particle you have, um, it will always have this specific wave nature associated to it. So where lambda here is the wavelength, um, that the symbol on the left hand side, and H is Planck's constant. It's as you expect, like another constant, like you find in nature, like the speed of light, et cetera, and P is the momentum. So if you sort of think about it, um, anything with a large momentum is going to have a small wavelength. So what that is actually telling us is that uh, in order to, under to, to sort of like see the wave nature of matter, you need to uh, have, you need to have uh, distances probing these, uh, the, to, to the scales of the wavelength of that particular matter particle. And um, for, uh, as, as you get like more heavier sort of uh, particles, the smaller their wavelengths become and the harder it becomes to probe them. But for the case of electrons, which are still fairly light, we can do this. And um, uh, we, we can uh, do this by um, 
uh, saying that, oh, okay, this applies to everything in nature and you know that everything can behave like particles. So as long as we have small enough distance, uh, as long as we have the way of probing small enough distances, then we can see the wave nature of everything. And as you can see from my background, um, this is actually the wave function of the universe. So the, not only can you apply this to protons, neutrons, and everything else, but we can also apply this to the whole the universe as a whole, which acts like the wave. Um, it's a pretty cool concept. Um, and just to show that I'm not lying, <laughs> there's uh, experimental proof that this is actually true. Um, so uh, these are these are known as diffraction. That these experimental um, procedures that we use are known as diffraction experiments. So what you essentially do is that you um, send in a particle with high enough energy um, and you uh, send it through slits, which is small enough to then probe the wave of nature. And the people who came up with these were, were George Thompson uh, and uh, uh, two other scientists uh, independently verified the, these results with the electron called uh, Clinton. Davison and Lester Gamma. And um, this, uh, uh, this experiment doesn't necessarily, as I said, necessarily have to apply to an electron. If we could probe at small enough scales, we could probe something like me. I also have my own wave-like nature. If you go to small enough scales, if you look at me with a very, very strong microscope, um, you would be able to see my wavelength nature as well. So um, what does that tell us? So we've gone from going to an approximate um, quantum model uh, called the Bohr model to now finding that this is probably not right because we're still in this like regime of using particles to explain our understanding of um, atoms and nature as a whole. And we now know that we should be using something like waves to sort of explain everything. And this is what kind of leads us to our um, wave-like model of the atom, where the electrons are no longer orbiting the nucleus like a planet orbiting the sun, but they're actually these waves, these electron waves surrounding the nucleus. Um, and they can, uh, they, they're, the you can actually sort of understand the specific wavelengths that they can take as just sort of complete wavelengths around the nucleus. So the case of the first electron shell or the orbit around the nucleus, you have just uh, one wavelength. Um, in the case of the second shell, you have two wavelengths, etc. So this brings us to the concept of a wave function, which I've probably mentioned before. So what is a wave function? Well, a wave function is basically our mathematical under, uh, our mathematical way of modeling this wave-like nature of matter or just anything that we're trying to perform. So as physicists, we work with these um, wave functions and we uh, apply certain principles to them to then understand how they evolve. Um, and for some of my research, I actually like think of the universe in terms of the wave function, and I'm able to sort of understand how the universe evolves using the physical principles that we have to then extract information regarding the early universe and other cool things like that. So what kind of physical principles am I actually talking about? Well, um, uh, uh, the thing that you've all probably heard in um, other sort of like popular science talks is the uncertainty principle. So um, I'm going to kind of give everybody um, a chance to uh, kind of do this experiment with me, which is simply just throwing a ball or any other sort of object up in the air. And um, if you sort of take a snapshot of this ball in the air, or in this case, just some random object that I have at home, um, you'll see that um, if you try to measure the velocity and position of this at some point during its trajectory, 
up and down it you won't be able to tell exact you 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 would you would sort of classically think that you'd be able to tell what its position and its velocity is at a certain point during its um during its fall and um the point of this is that um well like classically speaking we think we can measure both at the same time but if you think about it more carefully when i'm looking at something um let's say like i take a snapshot of this on its way down here um what's actually happening is light is um reflecting off this object and going into my eyes and those photons that actually reflect off this surface and back into my eyes are going to affect this specific object. So although I might be able to tell its position at a certain point in time, I will immediately have changed its velocity. And if you if you think about the, this, you can think of the equivalent for something like an electron, a very small thing. If you if you hit a photon on an electron, it's going to affect it quite drastically. The case of this is not really going to do anything. You won't notice it um, unless, like I said, you go onto very small scales. But if you went to the case of like an electron, a photon is quite comparable to an electron. So an electron in this equivalent setup would be shifted quite a lot. And this is where the idea of the uncertainty principle comes to home, uh, comes comes to play basically. And um, if you were to do it the other way around, measure the velocity and then the the position of this thing um you would measure a different velocity um to um what you would have measured initially and your your position would have been different to the first time around when you did measuring the position first and the velocity um and uh, these this can basically be summed up in a very specific way and that's by this idea of non-commutativity. So that probably sounds quite scary, but I promise you it's not that bad. Um, what, what we are saying by this like very big word is that um, basically, classically speaking, we know that when we use numbers, which are the more intuitive things that we use in day-to-day -day basis, um, we know that um, multi multiplying one thing uh, well, multiplying two things together one way and then two things together the other way. So for this example, A times B, um, we know that we're going to get the same thing. We know A times B is equal to B times A. But actually, in the case of the quantum world, we know that doing certain things in one way will not necessarily mean the same thing the other way around. And that's just what non-commutativity is called. And this then leads to the sort of like the algebra and the mathematics that we use to give us the results that we find in quantum physics, and at least a whole plethora of cool relations that we find, and the uncertainty principle is one of them. Now, this all probably sounds really like vague and just sort of like out of place and doesn't really make any sense, but I promise you this is actually a thing. So when we actually apply the uncertainty principle to the universe, and like just everything around us, taking something as simple as just empty space, literally like when I say empty space, just don't think of anything whatsoever, no particles, you're nothing, just literally empty space. And that's quite hard to picture actually, if you think about it, because we're kind of used to being surrounded by things, but empty space like is a lot more well, a lot less boring than you expect it to be because of this uncertainty principle. Because of the uncertainty principle and the, the weird wackiness of quantum physics, we actually find that empty space is not as boring as you expect it to be, but it does all this cool stuff in the background. And this is what we call a vacuum and these well, weird things that are popping in and out are called vacuum fluctuations. and that this is this is actually true like we know that this is definitely correct because we find these in other aspects of nature um but yeah like uh, i hope you can kind of appreciate how cool this is like we literally have nothing but then all this wacky stuff is going on um and this you can apply this principle to anything like 
even if we cool down something to absolute zero where you expect it not to be moving nothing going on whatsoever we still have this thing according to quantum physics called zero point energy and um so even zero energy or like what we conceive to be zero energy is still not nothing <laughs> um and then as you can tell we can apply this to other things so we can apply this to the universe and in the early universe we know that these vacuum fluctuations would have occurred and um we can actually experimentally verify this we see this in what um to quote david tong uh professor david tong at cambridge uh, in the fireball of the early universe so the early universe spat out this uh, massive amount of radiation um and in this radiation we actually see these vacuum fluctuations in these um in, in the fluctuations of the radiation that we then observe today. And it, it this is experimentally verifiable. We've got some very high tech telescopes and stuff which have proven these exist. So that's pretty cool. Another really cool place that we see these vacuum fluctuations is black holes. So um, some of you may have heard of Hawking's um, Hawking radiation and uh, Hawking radiation is an application of these vacuum fluctuations to one of the most abstract concepts that we can think of, but we know exist in the universe, which is black holes. And if we apply these vacuum fluctuation ideas to black holes, we get this emission of radiation from the black holes. So they're not these gargantuas which just absorb everything, they also emit things because of these vacuum fluctuations. What actually happens is that you have these fluctuations creating a particle and an antiparticle pair, and one particle goes into the black hole and the other leaves. And this, in order to conserve energy, you need the black hole to lose mass. And when you think about that, um, eventually the black hole will have to disappear completely. And that leads us to the black hole information paradox which is this problem that arises when we know that black holes have to disappear, but we don't know what happens to all the things that they absorbed. And if you want to learn more about that, you can uh, attend the Cambridge Science Festival talks, um, which are occurring later this month, uh, I believe between the 29th of March and 2nd of April. So myself and others um, at Cambridge, including Matt, uh, we've uh, organized these talks to uh, describe this really cool problem in physics in more detail because black holes disappearing cause a lot of problems which I don't have time to go into detail now but yeah you can learn more about later so yeah thank you for listening and um I just want to say thank you to all the um academics and friends who've uh, supported me during my journey in academia um uh, a lot of academics know that the pursuit of academia is not one that you do by yourself and also a shout out to my partner and uh um who's watching she's uh watching this right now and she's been a great rock to me so yeah and a thank you to not only uh, professor kathy clark but um, all the other academics like dr carolyn crawford professor Anne christine davies dr chandra maganguli dr martin Bourne, harry goodhue Oliver Philcox and Dr. Nick. But, um, so I wouldn't be doing this uh, what I do today without them. So I just want to use this opportunity to thank them. So cool. Cool. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Angram, for that absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, it's uh, one of the things about doing these talks online is that you don't get to stand in the, in the thunderous applause after you finish, but you'll just have to Im imagine it, of course. <laughs> Um, I uh, say, so yes, uh, questions for our speaker. Anyone that has a question uh, for Angran, please just stick them down there in the, uh, in the YouTube chat. Um, first question <laughs> comes from, uh, uh, first question says, uh, comes from a, a user called Soupy Campbell. I wonder if that's their real name. Um, they want to know if all particles are waves, 
how does the waveform actually change uh, you know when when the particles are affected like do they do things like vibrate in opposite directions or what can you say about that okay yeah no no that's a, a very good question and um, yeah so um when we well, when we think about these particles as waves like i said we use this thing called the the wave function but um the these these wave functions kind of behave the way you expect normal waves to behave so waves can be reflected transmitted um there's even these things uh, the, these like uh, concepts of tunneling uh, so uh, although there might be a barrier in the way you can actually have a wave um going across um the barrier um because yeah one thing that i guess that i didn't have time to mention is that the these these quantum principles all uh, occur on a probabilistic basis. Um, so um, that means that yeah, you, you have various phenomena which can occur. So, yeah, I hope that answers that question. So yeah, you can, you know, you can do every loads of different things with these waves. It doesn't have to just be sort of like reflecting and stretching and stuff. But there's even more things that you can do to quantum waves that you can do to classical waves. Uh, we have a question from Raj who wants to know, I mean, first of all, what does the word quantum actually mean? And by understanding the quantum universe, can we get a better measurement of the age, uh, age of the universe? Right. OK, um, so uh, the first question I can answer fairly quickly. So, yeah, um, I was hoping to, that I clarify that. But um, the, the, the word quantum it actually um, in terms of uh, like direct definition means discreteness. Now, um, yeah, without like sounding too mathematical, discreteness is basically just the way of saying um, you've got, mm, how do I say, uh, instead of, instead of things, uh, yeah, how do I think about this? Um, <laughs> Trying to think of something that is continuous as a natural thing. Uh, a wave is one thing, but like um, something. Okay, yeah. So something like um, so. If you think of a water wave, um, you you just have a continuous flow. Um, but in in what what we find in quantum physics is that you, these waves also have some sort of discreteness to them. So what that means is um, you don't just have um, a linear flow of things. You have um, these sort of packets of waves. And that's one of the things that Einstein found that waves, um, that light waves are, they are both continuous, but also packaged up into these little quanta, um, which we call photons. And in terms of the question about whether we can, the, the um, uh, sort of calculate the age of the universe from the wave function of the universe better uh my instinct is no uh, because the way we sort of <laughs> at least the way we understand the, the the wave function of the universe at the moment so um is that uh we know that it basically we we know it to a very basic sense um as you can imagine trying to understand the universe from a quantum perspective we have to take a very basic approach. So we we think of it as essentially empty with one very well what we feel, what we can sort of manipulate, which is called a scalar field, um, and that's all we can sort of manage in terms of our understanding of quantum physics. Um, in order to understand the age of the universe, you need to understand things like how um, stars and stuff do. So we need to go stars form and like how they how they get red shifted uh, how they emit light and basically that light gets shifted and stuff like that so um it involves a lot more complex phenomena that we just don't have the machinery to understand from a quantum perspective so we need to resort to more classical methods and from what we understand our classical um approximations of the universe's age are pretty good um but yeah if we ever get very good at quantum physics and like, then I guess, yeah, we might be able to potentially add in more complex things to rather than the single scalar field and then 
get a more detailed answer about the ATG index. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so question about your the vacuum fluctuations you mentioned. Um, do uh, do vacuum vacuum fluctuations get affected by the amount of stuff that's in the space? Like, can you get vacuum fluctuations in a volume of space that isn't actually a vacuum? Like, do we get vacuum fluctuations here on Earth? Oh, great. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. As in, yeah, so vacuum fluctuations can can sort of happen anywhere in, in a sense. Um, the, the point is, is that they're kind of noise that are drowned out by all the other things that are going on around them. So in the case of a black hole, um, like, like I said, like you, you do have something there, right? We don't quite understand exactly what a black hole is, but we know there's something there, basically. We call it a singularity, but like we don't know exactly. But um, the vacuum fluctuations still happen um, around this black hole, and uh, that black hole, um, as a result, then behaves a certain way. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 in a way, um, vacuum fluctuations are happening all around us, but yeah, we just kind of drown out that noise, if you want to think of it like that, because of all the other physical processes going on around us. Um, a question from Julia uh, that's uh, about about your scientific career, if you don't mind. So she wants to know, um, first of all, which scientist, either living or dead, uh, in, influ influenced your area of study the most? And secondly, she's wondering uh, if she wants to have a better understanding of all things quantum, who should she go and read? Right. OK. Um, it would be helpful to know Julia's age <laughs> regarding the second question. But um, yeah. Uh, the the uh, first question is that's very hard. Uh, I have a lot of great influences. Basically, all the people that you're seeing right now, I think I'm still sharing. Um, they are uh, brilliant inspirations and influences to me, um, including my my friends who are the same ages as me, basically. Um, but the person, that, okay, not just the person, but the people who inspired me when I was very young, one would have to be Michael Faraday. Um, I feel that I resonate with Faraday quite a lot um, because uh, he comes from a sort of similar background to me um, in, in terms of sort of the, uh, the financial and educational background that he came from. Um, and then in terms of sort of the actual physics I pursue, Faraday was actually, yeah, I think he, he saw the father of pretty much most modern physics, but um, in terms of the physics that kind of got me interested in reading more books it would definitely have to be Professor Stephen Hawking uh, I guess Stephen's stuff is just really cool and he he was sort of a master of various aspects of physics um, uh, his specialties were cosmology and gravitational physics but you could sort of tell that he knew his way around a lot of different areas of physics and uh, I'd like to sort of emulate that in terms of I think it's called uh, Quantum Mechanics of Theoretical Minimum. Is he's got other books with similar such kind of like doing physics calculations, the sort of stuff that students do. Then you could potentially pursue some of Fine Richard Feynman's books. Richard Feynman is known as being like one of the best sort of teachers of our time. So uh, he has some popular science books called uh, QED. Um, uh, I forget what sub part, sub heading part. I think it's just like the theory of light and matter. Um, and then uh, he he has a more comprehensive sort of lecture note style of books called the Feynman Lectures on Physics. Um, and those go from volumes one to three. Um, and then there's a small sort of like um, additional books. Uh, I think they're called uh, exercises on the Feynman Lectures on Physics or something. But yeah. Um, Feynman's um, books are a great read, I think. If you want to. I, I also read one when I was a teenager called In Search of Schrodinger's Cat by John Gribben, which is a very nice oh, introduction yeah, that... to physics. I'd say, you know, if, if you don't have like that much of a science background, it's a really nice introduction to quantum physics and all the kind of, uh, yeah, the, the weird quantum world that uh, Ayn Rand's been talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, who, I think, I think Len Suskin kind of, but Len Suskin, I guess, also kind of teaches it in a way, but yeah, uh, as this book title suggests, like theoretical minimum, it's meant to be quite an easy in going way of learning more about quantum stuff. But yeah, I'm um, interested I do, I do recall that I read one other book, um, sort of similar to that, but I can't remember the title of it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. Um, um, okay, so we'll do uh, one last question, if, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure, sure. So, uh, a nice and easy one to finish with. Um, are we getting close to a theory of quantum gravity? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, gosh. Um, Okay, I need to answer this in a way that I don't use too much technical jargon. Um, right. Okay, so one of the reasons why I study cosmology is because in the early universe, we have one of the best probes of quantum gravity. They, we know that this had like the highest energy level physics that we have. We actually call it a cosmological collider in, in modern physics, at least. Um, uh, so you know how we have the particle physics collider, um, uh, smashing things together at high energies to give us more understanding of these um, theoretical physics concepts, we, we, we can go to something much more higher energy, which is where these weird things like quantum gravity and stuff come into play in, uh, in cosmology. So, and there have been really big recent advancements in, in our understanding of quantum gravity by basically studying this cosmological collider in inverted commas and um i think yeah like we're get, we're doing quite well um i'm actually sort of getting more in tr into the quantum gravity side because uh, we have quite a few brilliant minds here in cambridge um who i'm kind of uh, starting to talk to and work with for my phd um and this wave function the universe idea is actually a very good sort of stepping stone towards that um, but yeah, I don't think I should say any more without sort of like just getting into a lecture, basically. <laughs> so yeah, I hope that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, uh, if I'm fairly successful during my PhD, um, I might have some contributions to our understanding of quantum gravity. But yeah, I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> so, um, but That's yeah, okay. um, we'll, we'll we'll have you back in three years' time to tell us all about how you solve quantum uh, gravity. This so. yeah. Yeah, then we can all have, I don't know, we can all just sort of uh, travel like we the travel like they do in Interstellar by plotting wormholes and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Angra. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, uh, thank you for the discussion. And to thank you, everyone at home who has been watching and enjoying. Um, uh, just the uh, Angra has already plugged it. But yes, the uh, w during the Cambridge Festival, we will be running a series of talks called Black Hole Wars. There'll be five talks with an, a panel of experts, um, including tonight's speaker. And they're going to be talking all about uh, all the kind of weird and wonderful physical things that go on with black holes. Um, so check our website for more details. And as always, we will be back next week. Uh, next week, we have Dr. Tran uh, Chandrima Ganguly, who Angra also uh, plugged earlier on. So to see her talk, join in next Wednesday at 7.15. Wonderful. See you guys.